Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. I'd like to talk about design in heaven and earth. And I'd like to focus on what I would call the big picture. Many times we run into questions and we wonder about the answer to some question. Sometimes they deal with biology, sometimes with geology, sometimes with other aspects. And we all run into questions that we can't answer. And sometimes we might get caught up in the, in the minutia, in the small issues. And I think it's good to step back and look at the big picture. What do we see in patterns in the way that the universe is structured? We don't know everything, but there are some things we can know. There are some things that we can see, some things that are given to us. And we can focus on those. I would like to bring three aspects of design in heaven and earth. Those three have to do with the universe, our world, that is what you might call the biosphere or the ecosphere, and the living creatures. We'll take a look first at the universe, looking to see design in the universe. And we find three aspects of the universe that I think give evidence of design. They are the origin of the universe, the order in the universe, and the fine-tuning of the universe. Let's take a look briefly at each of those. We're told the heavens declare the glory, of, the glory of God, and someone asked the question, do the heavens still tell? And I think the answer is yes. First of all, as we look at the universe, we see that science has proposed that the universe had a beginning. Now we know this, the theory of this called the Big Bang. I don't wanna talk so much about the Big Bang as about the idea that the universe has a beginning. When the idea was first proposed, many astrophysicists opposed the idea that there was a, a beginning. They preferred the idea that the universe was eternal because a universe that's eternal does not need to be explained. But if it has a beginning, then how do you explain that there was no universe and now there is? That's a philosophical problem and atheists did not like that idea. And one famous atheist named Fred Hoyle was kind of making fun of this idea of a big, uh, of a, it wasn't called a big bang at first. He was making fun of the idea that the universe suddenly just came into existence and he commented, oh, the universe didn't start out with some big bang. And the name stuck. That's where the name Big Bang came from, from an opponent of the idea that the universe had a beginning. Well, how do we explain that, that beginning? The Bible says there was a beginning also. And it says, in fact, that God created it. This is one of those points that we ought not to overlook. Both the Bible and science have come, to the, have, have come to the same point, that is, the universe had a beginning. Now there's a difference, perhaps, in the way the Bible might explain that and science might explain that. But the, the fact of the matter is that both the Bible and science say that the universe had a beginning. Now here we come to our first issue for design. How do you explain the origin of the universe? If we had no universe, and now we have a universe, something must have happened. As the little boy said to the astrophysicist after his lecture, he said, let me see if I understand what you're telling me. First, there was nothing, and then it exploded. How does nothing explode? There's something in the origin of the Big Bang or the origin of the universe that goes beyond what we can measure and sense. Something divine. Of course, naturalists resist the idea of a supernatural beginning. However, 
uh, there isn't a very good option left. Some propose that the universe emerged from a quantum fluctuation. One scientist once said, a universe is just one of those things that happens from time to time. Well, this really is begging the question and not really giving an explanation. Supernatural causation, as I see it, is the best explanation for the origin of the universe. And so I see design in this feature. The second issue is the order that's in the universe. One of the most reliable observations of nature is that over time, things tend to degenerate. Entropy increases. Heat is lost. It is, it's, uh, energy is lost to heat. Disorder increases spontaneously. And yet, when we look at the universe, we see quite a lot of order in the universe. Now, if the second law of thermodynamics is applied to the universe, there must have been more order in the past than there is now. And in the future, there will be less order than there is now, because that's the way this law operates. That's the pattern this law describes. Well, in that case, the order before our day is greater than it is now. How do we explain where that order came from? Is there a law that says order has to be somewhere in the universe? Not that anyone that I know of has ever thought of that. The law that we do see is that order declines, not increases. Where does the order come from? It seems to me the best explanation is that there's an intelligent creator who set it up in an orderly fashion. And so I see evidence of design in the order of the universe. The third issue is that the universe has a very precise, specific structure. That is, the mathematical properties of the universe, the physical constants, are very precisely tuned, if that's the right word, in such a way that life is possible. It's easy to imagine a universe in which life is not possible. In fact, the very existence of atoms and molecules depends on a fine balancing of the laws of physics, the nuclear forces. And beyond that, there are many other aspects that, uh, of the fine-tuning of the universe that are, that are precisely tuned. A slight change in any one of them could very well make it impossible for life to exist, at least any life that we would recognize. So naturalists have noticed this and have commented on it, and they say, well, how can this be? Are we, are we really so lucky? And some have proposed that our universe has gone through a series of big bangs and then big crunches, and then big bangs, and then big crunches, an oscillating universe, and we just happened, each, each time has a different set of laws, and we just happened to be in the lucky phase in which everything worked out, and so you have living things. Uh, that's a, I mean, nobody, I suppose, can prove that that's impossible, but it sure does stretch one's imagination to believe that. Another idea is that there's an infinite number of universes, and we just happen to be in the lucky one. Well, that reminds me of the exam question that was supposedly given in a class. Define what a universe is and give two examples. Uh, most of us would think the universe is, whatever, is everything that exists, and there's only one example. Uh, how do we talk about an infinite number of, of universes for which there is absolutely no evidence, nor could it be possible to have any evidence of that? is purely an ad hoc conjecture. Again, my conclusion is that creation by an intelligent God is the best explanation for the fact that the universe is finely tuned in such a way that life is possible. So, in conclusion, the three points that I would 
look at here the origin, the order, and the specific mathematical properties look very much like design to me and not like chance. God says, do the heavens still tell, continuing from Psalm 19, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. They're visible throughout the entire world. And God says in Isaiah 45, I, my hands stretched out the heavens. To God, the idea of the whole universe is something God does effortlessly, without struggle, just it's his will and it is done as he wants. Now let's take a look at the next uh, example, and that is our Earth itself, the planet and its features, and I will only have time for three features. We'll look at light, at atmosphere, and at water, on very briefly in each case. Thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. The Bible tells us that God had a purpose when he created this earth, and we can see evidence that the earth does appear to have a purpose in its properties and the way it is designed to support living organisms. Now, first of all, what, does it, what, does, what do living organisms need? Well, they need a source of usable energy, which, as we know, is for, largely from the sun. They need raw materials for building cells and so on. Those raw materials come from the environment, from the water, the atmosphere, and the soil. They need chemistry for energy usage. Even the, even the way that different materials interact is governed by a set of chemical and physical laws that are not themselves necessary. We could have a world in which the laws of chemistry were quite different. We have a world in which the laws of chemistry make possible chemical reactions that sustain the metabolic and living activities of cells and living organisms. We also need a suitable temperature and pH range. We need a system for distribution of heat and materials, which water and the, the ocean and rivers and so on and the air provide. Well, think of, first of all of sunlight. Sunlight provides energy for living organisms. And when you think about the sun's output, the sun is a star, and there are many, many stars out in the, in the sky, in the heavens, and many of them, the majority of them, do not produce energy of an appropriate type to support life. But our sun does. The amount of energy that it puts out is sufficient to trigger chemical reactions in plant leaves in the presence of chlorophyll and other enzymes and, coenz and, and molecular factors, but not so much energy to tear apart the cells of the leaf itself. It's a balance between not enough energy or not too much energy. And combined with that is the fact that the heat output from the sun combined with the distance from the earth, the re heat retention properties of water and atmosphere, combine to create a habitat, a, a, a biosphere in which uh, living organisms can survive in that temperature range that they need. I mean, it looks to me like the sun is either very lucky or it's designed. The atmosphere is also an important feature of design for our world. The atmosphere provides important materials such as oxygen and nitrogen. We know that if oxygen is present in too high a concentration, it will destroy life. We know if it's in too low a concentration, it won't support any intelligent life. It might support certain anaerobic bacteria or something, but uh, oxygen is present in an appropriate concentration to support uh, 
advanced, if you prefer, uh, complex creatures. Nitrogen is an interesting uh, part of the atmosphere. If you, have, if you want to put oxygen, but you don't want it to be too concentrated, you need to disperse it in some medium to dilute it. Many, many gases, I suppose, could be chosen to dilute the oxygen. Nitrogen is the one that is present in our, in our atmosphere. Nitrogen is safe enough that when you breathe it in, it doesn't destroy your body, your, your cells on the inside. It's relatively inert, and yet it does have the capacity to react with nitrogen under certain conditions and provide nitrates which are necessary for plant growth. So it's a very clever arrangement. At the same time, there are many gases that are toxic, but our atmosphere does not have many toxic gases, and the ones that it does have are largely produced by our own bad choices. So the atmosphere is, is appropriate for life, and it very well could be otherwise. There is no law that says atmospheres have to be supportive of life, as we can easily see by looking at the other planets and their atmospheres. Water, of course, is a very famous example of a material that supports life. In fact, water is so important for life that scientists who are wondering if there might be life on one of the other planets are not looking for cities, they're not looking for automobiles, they're looking for water. If it doesn't have water, probably it doesn't have life. That's how crucial water is. When you drive through the deserts of southwestern United States, you will find cities in odd places. One of the oddest is Las Vegas. Why would anybody put a city out in the middle of that forsaken desert? Well, it turns out there's a river that flows nearby, and so there's a source of water. Without that water, there would be no city there. Water moderates Earth's temperatures. It's an excellent solvent, carries materials around, and it's an all-around useful material for living organisms. Now, if you don't believe in creation, you want, don't believe in God, how do you explain the fact that our Earth is so well designed? Well, it's lucky. That's really all you have to look for. It's just the way things happen to be. You happen, just happen to have the right size of sun and moon and earth and distance between them, the right size of earth and speed of rotation. You just happen to have this, the suitable energy output from the sun, a suitable atmosphere, the properties of water, the presence of water and land. Perhaps you weren't yet born when the first pictures came back of the earth from space. But many people recognize that moment when the earth was seen from space as this little blue spot in the universe. And it changed people's perception of the earth in a big dramatic way. We've become accustomed to it now, but before that time, nobody could step back and look at the earth. It was just what we could see from one spot to another. Now we recognize we are an island of water and an island of life in a sea of darkness and uh, hostile conditions. We have suitable elements in chemistry. Now, if you believe in luck, you can believe that this might be an explanation for our world. Personally, I'm a little skeptical about that. It seems to me too much like someone winning the lottery three times in a row. You may not be able to prove it, but it sure looks suspicious if somebody wins a lottery three times in a row. And likewise, I can't prove that the earth is designed, but it sure looks like it. The well, life requires very specific combinations of environmental conditions, and there is no other planet that's known to be able to support intelligent life. Now, there are some pro proposals, and perhaps life could be here or there, but there hasn't been any confirmation of that, and scientists, of course, are still looking. Perhaps they'll find one. But as far as I know, uh, they haven't confirmed anything yet that really looks like it's completely the way we would need it to be for life. God says, the land is mine. 
in Leviticus when he's talking to the Hebrews in the wilderness. The earth is the Lord's in its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein, said the psalmist. Truly, the world looks like the Lord planned it. Now let's take a look at the living creatures themselves. And again, we'll look at three aspects, the origin of life itself, the origin of diversity, and the origin of humans. First of all, for the origin of life, we have a very interesting scientific problem. The number of features that are necessary for life to arise spontaneously is quite striking. And a lot of, science, a lot of study has been given to this you would have to have some kind of a boundary because otherwise the cell wouldn't be different from the chemicals in, the, in, the, in its surroundings. So you have to have a boundary which is taken by a semi-permeable membrane or a selectively permeable membrane. You need a metabolism, which is a system of enzymes and uh, other factors that are working together to process molecules and release the energy in them and use that energy for uh, processes of the cell, need some way of storing energy, which as we know is the DNA and other aspects that are not so well known, like the cytoskeleton. You need some kind of a replication mechanism to reproduce and copy that, that uh, information. And you need all of that, if you're thinking of, uh, of a naturalistic or mater atheistic way of getting it. You need all those things at the same time in the same place. And scientists try to study how they could get one of those things to come into being, but uh, even, to get, even just to get one of them coming into being seems an impossible situation. To get all of them at once is, uh, is beyond my ability to, uh, to, I don't have that much faith. It's beyond my ability to, to believe. Here are some more problems for the naturalistic view. And probably if you've looked into the origin of life, you've, you've come across these. We won't take time to look through them, but the, each of these problems is serious and uh, there just doesn't seem to be a naturalistic way of producing life. And many scientists have recognized the difficulty and some have even said, I've heard so much speculation, I'm tired of watching this. Let me know when you succeed, otherwise I'm not watching. <laughs> and others have said, it seems like a miracle. And of course, I would say, I think it does too. It is a miracle that we have living organisms. Notice that these are not the kinds of problems that you can solve by just waiting longer. You know, if you have billions of years, does that solve the problem? No, it doesn't matter if something's impossible it won't happen no matter how much time you throw at it. So let's move on now to the question of diversity. How do we get all these different living things? Job said, uh, God told to Job, ask the beasts and they will tell you. No, it was Job, sorry, that said that to his friends. Ask the beasts and they will tell you the hand of the Lord has done this. And God in speaking to Job said, look at the behemoth. I made him along with you. And God seems kind of pleased with the behemoth. He, I don't know if he's bragging here, but he's, he's pointing out to Job, you know, look at this. This is a good job that I did here with behemoth. And uh, admire him. And when we see the diversity of life, we can, I think, with justice, admire the Creator. Now, what do we need to produce the diversity of life? Well, if you're thinking of it from an atheistic or evolutionary viewpoint, you would first need some way of producing li life itself to begin with, usually thought of in the form of a living cell. You need some source of genetic information to create specific genes. You need specificity in the DNA sequences. How do you get that? The best and only known way to do that is through intelligence, some kind of intelligent input. You also need a mechanism to convert genetic information into body structures. We call this embryological development. How is it that a single cell, an, a fertilized egg or zygote, how is it that that cell can somehow divide into two, four, eight, 16, eventually form a, a ball or sphere of cells and eventually a complex adult organism? It's an amazing situation. And how do you get a, a single cell to learn to do that. 
it seems to me the best and probably only reasonable explanation is that there was intelligent input into the creation and, de and design of that process. And then a mechanism to transfer genetic information from one ge generation to the next, reproduction in other words. Again, accomplished through a mutual interaction of proteins and nucleic acids in which the proteins are pr produced by the nucleic acids and the nucleic acids require proteins for their production. Mutual interdependence. How do you get such a system like that started unless you have both of them present at once? A very, I think, telling issue in favor of intelligent design and creation. Creation is the only known possibility for these things. Now, that when we think of the problems of being an atheist, you think, first of all, the origin of new gene functions is a problem. The origin of meiosis and sexual reproduction is a problem. The origin of development and cell specialization is a problem. The origin of new organs and body plans is a problem. And adding more time to the mix does not, in my view, solve the problem. It just extends the difficulty over longer periods of time. When we think of natural selection now, we ought to say something about natural selection. There is little doubt that organisms vary. We know that. We can see that. And we know that natural selection eliminates the unfit and species change over time. We know that that happens. That's not, that's not an issue. But there is very strong doubt that this process has anything to do with the origin of different kinds of organisms. We have redwood trees and elephants. What kind of a process would explain how they would differentiate from a common ancestor? It doesn't, in my view, seem very likely that little differences that acted upon by natural selection would ever accomplish very much on that, uh, at that scale. Long ages of time do not create new physical mechanisms for diversification. And evolutionists themselves have come to admit in many cases, although not so publicly, that in fact, if Darwin's theory were true, the fossil record would look completely different from the way it looks. And I have heard rumors that evolutionists are ser searching for a new theory even at this moment. Every beast of the forest is mine, says the Lord, living things both small and great in Psalm 104. And all the beasts God claims, and we can rightly see that he must be the creator of all the diversity that we see. Now, what about humans? Here we run into some very interesting questions because, of course, we're talking about ourselves here. And that raises the, the interest to a great and a much higher level than for anything else. David asks an interesting question in Psalm 8. When I consider the heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? What is man? According to Psalm 119, your hands have made me and fashioned me. And of course, uh, there are other texts, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, we may come to that. Well, what are humans? First of all, humans are unique. There is no other creature like humans. We may have some, we do in fact, have many similarities, but think of the differences. Self-consciousness, so, there is some, some have claimed that other animals have a, some degree of self-consciousness. That, that may be true. But I don't think any of them have self-consciousness in the sense that humans do, being aware of our own existence and our own mortality and our own relationships in abstract thinking with another, another uh, unique feature of humans, abstract thought, free will. Now, of course, if you are an atheist, you would probably deny that we have free will. But I think most of us believe that we do have free will. In fact, 
we even punish people who make choices we think are bad choices, and that really wouldn't make much sense if we didn't think they had the ability to choose otherwise. We do believe in free will. We're the only creatures with expression through speech. Now, lots of creatures make noises and sounds and signals, and they even have what you might call a little bit of a language, but nothing comparable to human speech. Another feature that I find very interesting is morality. Humans have a sense that there are some things they ought to do and some, some things they ought not to do. Now, sometimes animals can show that they know they sh that you don't want them to do some certain things. Your dog or cat sometimes can act kind of guilty when you catch them in a situation that they know they shouldn't be in. But I don't think that's morality. I think that's more likely to be fear of what might happen to them. And I hope that our morality is more than that. Altruism, the idea that we might sacrifice our own interests in favor of someone else, that does not fit in evolutionary theory, but yet we do see it in reality. We have a sense of God's presence. It seems like everybody, it's been said everyone has in their heart a space that's shaped like God, a space where only God can fit. So I think even those who run from God have a sense that there must be a God. Sometimes I think an atheist is one who says, there is no God and I hate him. I wonder if atheists really believe there is no God. I think more often is that the God that they understand is a hateful God. And I think that's where our text in Revelation 14 comes in. I saw another angel having the gospel and that gospel message includes creation. And I think it is good news to know that God cares for us, that God made us and that he has a plan for us. That's all part of the gospel. Well, naturalist science postulates the origin of humans by descent with modification from apes. Let's make sure we understand nobody claims that humans evolved from chimpanzees. Sometimes people ask, well, if humans evolved from chimpanzees, why are there still chimpanzees? That's not what the theory proposes. The theory proposes that humans evolved from some extinct ape and he, chimpanzees also evolved from that extinct ape. If you go back far enough, the two ancestral lines converge into one. That's the theory. And the arguments for that is that humans don't appear until the top of the fossil column and there are fossil intermediates between humans and ape-like creatures and there are many genetic and morphological similarities. So it's not just something imagined, there are arguments that are made in favor of this idea. And frankly, I don't have answers to some of these questions. Why don't we find fo human fossils except at the top of the column? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, some ideas have been proposed, I'm not really satisfied with them, but. Uh, one idea is that perhaps, this is a fairly common idea, that it, during the flood, humans would have escaped longer than any other kind of animal because they're more intelligent. That means they would have been the last ones to be buried. Then after the flood, as erosion is, and has come about and the, and the sediments have been worn away, they would be the first ones to be destroyed. Well, that might be. It kind of makes sense, and yet somehow it doesn't seem to me to be really a complete answer. Uh, another idea is that maybe there are pre-flood humans, but they had already degenerated to the point that they were no longer giants, and so we don't recognize them. And a third idea that's not on the, on the screen is that when God said he would destroy the humans, he destroyed them. So there's not even any record of them left. Well, it's one of those questions I don't know. It's one of those questions that if I focus on them, I may not see the big picture. But when I look at the big picture, I see design all the way through, and I'm encouraged to know whatever the answer is, God has things in his hands. Here are some 
some of the skulls that, uh, that are intermediate between, uh, between humans and uh, other hominids. And we, what are they? We don't know what they were. Uh, they, they seem to be, one, one, one thing that we notice about these, this series of skulls, for a particular feature, or if, for a complex of features, it's not a gradual change in the whole thing. It's one feature changes one way, another feature changes another way, so that there isn't any clear overarching pattern in which all the features are consistent. There are these inconsistencies leaving us to wonder what did happen. That's called mosaic, uh, mosaic pattern. Humans and apes also do have many similar genes and body structures, and why do we have some unique similarities? And that's a good question. But before we get carried away with that question, here's another one. An orphan gene is a gene that's found in one species but not any other species. And now with the advances in genomics, it has been discovered that humans have about 200 genes that are found only in humans. Now, unless you have some kind of creation going on, it's a little hard for me to believe that new genes just pop into existence. Even evolutionists have a hard time with that. Evolutionists believe that genes are duplicated and then the, dupli the extra gene is then free to, uh, to, to evolve. And there's problems with that, but time doesn't permit us to go into all aspects of the question. But the fact that there's something like 200 known genes that are found in humans and nowhere else, I think is a strong argument for the separate creation of humans. And the similarities in the DNA are much less than are sometimes reported and the, the differences are quite important. In fact, scientists are suspecting that the parts that were not tracked carefully because they were thought to be unimportant may actually be what's making the difference between humans and apes, not the protein genes, which was, were the ones that are known to be important and carefully tracked. So the unique features of humans point to design. To the atheist, we would ask the question, how could a mere collection of molecules become aware of itself, have a will, freedom to act, and have feelings of morality? That's one question for the atheist. Another question for the Darwinist, who may or may not be an atheist, what evolutionary process would drive hominids to achieve greater abilities than needed for survival? Truly, humans have abilities that are not at all needed for survival. The appreciation of beauty and art and music and many other things are not needed for survival. How would you explain those from natural selection? It seems to me natural selection is an inadequate method of explaining that. Humans appear to me to be intelligently created. So some conclusions. I see life originating by divine creation, and I think that that's a very difficult uh, position to overturn. Life was created in diversity. Life has varied and diversified since the creation. Yes, what we see today is different from what was created, and there are many changes. But that does not explain why we have redwood trees and elephants. Humans are unique in many ways reflecting their special creation. And biodiversity is helpfully represented as an orchard of family trees, not a single family tree such as you often see, but an orchard. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have made him a little lower than the angels, said David, as he had asked, what is man that you are mindful of him? You have made him a little lower of angels, crowned him with glory and honor, and made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. So, in conclusion, we see design in the universe, in the environment, and in diversity. When we look at the big patterns, we see design from the origin of the universe, we see design in the, in the formation of our world. We see design in living cells. From the beginning to the end of the story, 
I see design at every step. Naturalism does not work. Naturalism is an, an, an almost a synonym for atheism. It simply doesn't work. There's no remotely plausible naturalistic explanation for the origin of the years, universe or the origin of life. And just adding more years does not change that situation. So I think naturalism is defeated philosophically by observations from science. The creation shows clear evidence of divine activity. We don't know everything. And we need to know, we need to recognize that, and that's okay. We don't have to know everything. We don't have explanations for every problem that's brought to us. And one of the chief problems is why does the geologic record appear to take a long time when the biblical record seems to indicate a short time? And there are some interesting features in that, but it's still a question that I don't think we have a satisfactory, complete answer for it. But no theory of origins explains everything. And if you try evolutionary atheism, theistic evolution, gap theory, day-age theory, all the other theories, none of them does any better than biblical creation. Each of us has our problems. The problems may be different, but everyone has its problems and challenges. So therefore, I feel there's no reason for me to change from biblical creation. What I do learn is that nature, there is more to nature than science can discover. Nature itself points to a supernatural designer whose actions can be best known through special revelation. And the best answer to many of our questions can be found in the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. And I commend to you that study. When you have questions, look to see how the Creator Himself acted in our world when he revealed himself in person. And I conclude with this text from Psalm 104, a hymn in praise of creation. In wisdom you have made them all. When you look at the world, look at the universe, look at the living organisms, you may see evidence of a creator.